We spared no expense on three sides of whatever the fuck the show's <laughs> called. Why do I get to do the cold intro? Because the rules I, are every time you're on the show, you get to do it. I'm tardy to the party. Just fall off the chair again. That'll work. <laughs> All right, go. Tell me when. Go. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> this week. This week on Three Sides of the Court, we are joined by radio veteran Michael Cross, who Michael and Tommy know very well. I was targeted to the party, so I had to join in late. But in addition to that, you will also witness me fall off the chair. So if this is not a reason to tune in between Michael Cross and me falling off the chair, I don't know what to tell you. And she's not even drunk. I'm not even drunk. It's heat exhaustion. I mean, oh, sure, sure. He ex- well, that's true. Your husband did come in and put a fan blowing up your dress behind you. That's yeah, also I'm caught on sweat. camera. If I had balls, I'd be sweating them off right now. <laughs> oh. God. <laughs> You'd be rearranging the boys, right? I feel like adjusting. I mean, that's how I fall off my chair. I was adjusting. You real? You were adjusting, and then you realized, God, I got nothing to adjust. I got nothing to adjust. <laughs> I fell off my chair. Oh. oh Lord, I can't believe you saw that. <laughs> this is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. This is Robert, one of Three Sides' 13 fans, here with Uncle Gene, who has a message for Mike. Ranvold, you're a tool. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of the two co-hosts. I don't know if we've ever done this to some before. I don't think so, Michael. I kind of like it. Michael and Lisa. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mark's not with us. Just imagine Mark is right now sitting on a beach, a blue Speedo, dipping shrimp in ice cream. Is he wearing the one like is he wearing with the with the the mankini? Oh, that is. Did you see? I I don't that, think I don't think Mark's a mankini there? type of guy. I think he's just a good old simple speedo. <laughs> keeps it simple. Keeps it simple. He follows tradition. Just a good old speedo. <laughs> um, no, Mark's on vacation this week. He's on vacation next week. Tommy will join us in a little bit. Uh, Actually, you know, I'll you in a little bit too. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you'll just join us late. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Can you follow this logic? Lisa's here right now, but will disappear, and then it's going to come back late? Tommy's not, not here, and will show up, and then leaves early? <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> God. We don't give a crap. No. It is how it is, people. Just um, so, yes, next week, Mark won't be here again. I won't be here next week. Applause, applause. Next week it'll just be Tommy and Lisa. Yeah. You guys better do a good show. I want to see all the video. We're going to be so awesome. So, um, listen, you know, Tommy bolted early, so once again he gets out of reading his comment. I don't know why we have him on the show. Pretty face, I guess. I don't know. Oh, that's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Not a pretty face for Tommy. Um, let's see. Minnesota Meetup, July 24th. Joe Sensors, Bloomington, Minnesota, 7 p.m. Be there. Tommy and I are going to be there. We're going to be drinking. We're going to be eating. We got some free stickers, trading cards to give away. And we're just going to be talking kiss. All night, probably till we close the place down again and they kick us out. Damn, where's it's a fun time. I'd love, you know what I'd love if you showed up and you fell off a bar stool. Oh, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even drinking. <laughs> Let me just give everybody a little teasing preview. In a little bit later in the show here, Lisa falls <laughs> okay. off her chair. <laughs> And it was very dramatic. She just sits. She falls. just sits oh. there and falls off the chair. 
you know, because I haven't been on the on this stool for a while. Because every time you see me, I'm in a very um, I'm in a new location. I'm either in Miami or I'm in Boston. So this is like unfamiliar territory for me for a while. I wasn't used to the chair situation. Your butt isn't used to this chair, no, right? It's not used to like a bar stool. I, just, I, w I was like ready to lean back and. <laughs> Whatever. You know. I think we're going to edit that little segment out and make just a little blooper reel of Lisa falling off if the chair. I could bring a little bit of humor to everybody's day by me almost falling off the chair, then so be it. So be it. And so be it. So be it. It was. It was. It's worth it. It's worth it. Um, this week we have a special guest joining us, all the way from the beaches of Iowa. Where he was, you, you, you would you would you wouldn't know you wouldn't know this because you were late getting on the show. Yeah, I was a little late. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're, we we are joined by Michael Cross, a radio industry veteran, um, who is currently in Iowa right now, but he's worked in stations all over the country. Tommy and I know him from when he worked up in Minneapolis at KJJO. Um, he's just going to share. His insights of being in radio, he started in radio in 1980, what it's like working radio and radio promotion and KISS in radio and all that stuff. Gives us some great behind-the-scenes insight. like How it's changed and how it's evolved. Like kids, don't bother calling a request. It just means nothing. You just want to call to talk to the DJ. We all know. Let, let me ask you, Lisa. I should have asked Michael this because you, you spent time in radio. So caller 103, they don't really pick up 103 calls before they go to caller 103. It's just whenever that DJ is done doing whatever they're doing. You're caller 103. <laughs> yeah, you're really not. No, you're really not. They'll pick you up in about five minutes, and it, like, it depends. Like, once the, once the DJ is done putting the rack in for the commercial or whatever, it's like, oh, yeah, i gotta hit, got to hit somebody. Hey, congratulations. You're caller 200. You just won. You are your caller like four. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was just luck of the draw. It's really luck of the draw. It is. It is. All the illusion. It's like the Wizard of Oz, right? Don't look behind the curtain. That's why radio is so awesome. It still is awesome. It is. I love it. I love radio. Anyway, Michael um, spends a good hour or so chatting with us about radio how KISS was viewed in radio, how they were promoted by the record labels, um, all kinds of cool insights. So let it roll. Michael Cross talking about radio. Me falling off my chair. Oh, that's the best part. Sorry, Michael, but she did fall off a chair. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Everybody, I want to welcome this week's special guest. Um, we are joined by Michael Cross, who is... Unemployed, on the beach, radio industry veteran. Is that what your business card says right now? Uh, yeah, yeah, it kind of does, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so you um, live the life. On the beach. Well, I, 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 for, first I was going to ask you, what kind of beaches are there in Iowa? You know, there's not a lot of them. Fortunately, uh, I live near a lake, and there's, you know, maybe, oh, I don't know, three or four inches of sand. You know, you can walk out. <laughs> I was going to say, only beach we I was gonna say, are the beaches around like the 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 cow manure ponds? <laughs> I, I should try that. Could just go out in the country and find. You just some gave water. a great idea. <laughs> yeah, they, I need something to do. You know. Anyway, um, Michael, why don't you take a, a a couple minutes here and just share with everybody your radio history, what you've done in the radio industry. Oh, man, that would take a while. But uh, the Reader's Digest condensed version says uh, I started in this crazy business uh, when I was a teenager and uh, did Top 40 radio for quite a few years in the 80s. 
kind of ended up in a rock format in the uh, late 80s, and uh, that's really what I've been doing since, programming stations, uh, been an operations manager for a number of years, kind of overseeing a few stations, and rock music, that's uh, that's pretty much what it's been. It's been great. And, of course, on the air all this time, too. So have you been primarily in the Midwest area, upper Midwest? Um, well, for the last 20-some years I have. I've been... I was fortunate to spend 20 years of my last gig, so that helped uh, some stability there. But uh, but outside of that, I've been everywhere from Montana to Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas. And seems like everywhere in between. So I think I ended up in nine states uh, throughout the career. Up and down the dial, as they say, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's right. Yeah. How how long did it take you to master that um, ability to, to speak over a song as it starts up and finish what you're saying right before they start to actually say now, The technical term is hitting the post, right? Hitting the hitting post. Hitting the post. <laughs> you know, that definitely is a skill that uh, I always felt it was where – if you had a nine-second intro, you had to figure out what you were going to do pretty quickly. And uh, well, that definitely takes some time to kind of get that down. It's a lost art because there's a guy here in town on one of the radio stations that is KFAN. It's a sports radio. His name is uh, Dan Cole, the common man. And on weekends, he spins records on 108, which is an oldie station, which is now the 80s. And he does that. And it's just like it takes me back to when I was a kid because it's something they, that people just don't do anymore because there's bar- very few live DJs. Yeah, and I love doing that. And uh, yeah, I did get a chance to do that here. One of the stations that I was working with was a classic hit station, much like Cool 108 up there. And, and it was great. So I would pull some shifts occasionally. And, oh, yeah, just like the old days, you know, hitting the post. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, not not that I've got anything that you could call radio experience, because all I did was a couple of years in college radio. But I remember there was always one or two of your favorite songs that you loved to pull out because you knew it had the the best intro for talking over. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. There were definitely songs that you just loved the intro, and it just sounded good underneath you as you talked. And yeah, I kind of missed that uh, that era of top. 40 and and sure. then, of course, there were always the songs that maybe it was like a brand new song. Oh, well, listen, I mean, again, college radio, we didn't put anything on the records that said this has has nine <laughs> seconds. It was sort of just like play it. And you had to kind of know it on your own. And all of a sudden you're talking and all of a sudden you're like, holy crap, the song's starting in one second. I got to shut up. <laughs> you can say a ton I, of hey, stuff. I've, I've, I've done that here with uh, <laughs> with songs that are brand new. I, you just forget that there's a, a zero, zero intro and the guy sings right away. And, oh, yeah, I've done that, too, where it's <laughs> like, hey, it's time for the brand new song. Oh, and the guy's already singing. You know? <laughs> they, they can't all be like Thunder Island. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all right. So, what's your favorite track to put on to go take a piss? Oh well, that's about. fairly quick. Um, <laughs> so I guess that wouldn't matter. But if, but if it's the uh, if, if it's the opposite, you know, there's always uh, some kind of tool song or uh, what's me something a, a little lengthy from them. I you know. I always loved um, in Agata Davida. That was that gave you more than enough time to walk down the hall, take the piss, come back, chat. You, you could drive the you could drive and go get a pizza and exactly. stuff and get back in time. It's true. I was driving through Arkansas at three in the morning once, and there was only one station in range. It was a rock station. They played in Agata Davida with the seventeen minute drum solo. <laughs> you know something well, was going on in the studio. Yeah. I'm like that guy's getting laid. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> well, there was that too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so so I remember you with um, Hot Rockin' 104, KJJO in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Ah, uh, yes. Those were crazy days. That, that was, you know, the heart of 80s metal when mm. basically nobody on radio wanted to play 80s metal. I mean, because 80s metal was not classic like it is now. I mean, Rat is classic metal now. But back then, Rat was brand new because the album just came out. And nobody was playing that stuff because it was looked down upon. And and Hot Rock and 104 comes out and plays nothing but that. It was like, you know, yeah, from heaven. It was the best thing in the world what you were doing. You know, that was a, I was so fortunate to be there 
the day it flipped because it was a classic rock station. And at midnight on the uh, on Valentine's Day of 1987, uh, we flipped it to, I guess it was metal. Yeah. And uh, for be- lack of a better term at the time. Mm-hmm. And so we went from playing Skinner and Zeppelin to, well, at midnight, I was the first guy on the air. And the first song on that station was Twisted Sisters, I Want to Rock. And go. it just went downhill from there. <laughs> downhill. <laughs> <laughs> well, it so, was a great time. So you are, I mean, you're a KISS fan. Otherwise, we wouldn't have you on this show. I mean, I don't care how smart you are, how talented you are. you got to be a KISS fan. So That's right. At, Definitely a KISS fan. So, so when, when, did, uh, when, when did KISS come into your life? How old were you when you first discovered KISS? Well, I'm going to date myself, of course. So my first experience with KISS was hearing rock and roll all night on the radio. And that would have been probably 1975. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't hip to the debut album. So uh, my, my first experience would have been Dressed to Kill. And once I saw that album cover, I absolutely had to have that record. Yeah. Um, it was just, they were just different from anything else I'd ever seen. And even musically, and it's funny because I know there's a, clearly there's a huge difference between 70s Kiss and uh, what they ended up in the 80s or 90s or 2000s. Um, but that was always my favorite era of Kiss was the 70s. And certainly the the lyrics were cheesy and all that good stuff, but. Man, at the time, um, it was just so different from everything else. Now, how how old would you have been? Uh, I would have been like fourteen. Okay. Per, per, perfect yeah, 13, perfect 14. age for discovering Kiss at that age. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, um, I was totally their target audience. <laughs> all right, give me one second here. Lisa is ready. I'm going to add the weather girl in. So give me a moment to add her. Lisa. Yeah. Yes, there? sir. I'm yeah. here. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. So, I'm so, so sorry. So on the phone, we have Michael Cross. Michael, say hi. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Michael. Whoa. <laughs> <She likes that>. <laughs> <laughs> Michael is a goalie. I, I, I a could, goalie. I could, Mike, I could just see your voice gave her goosebumps just as you said that. <laughs> yeah, she's going to slide off her seat. <laughs> I'm holding on to my stick as we speak. <laughs> nice. <laughs> hockey stick, Lisa. Hockey stick. Yeah, hockey yeah stick. he's a goalie. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> She's it used to it. Stick. Yeah. She's now, immune. Now, let, let's just be clear. Lisa has a face that is not made for radio. Oh, man. See, that's yeah. that's completely opposite of mine. Yeah, so we're just going to block us all too. of us out. Us yeah. too. <laughs> camera michael because my why am i not on camera that's a good reason because he has a face for radio yeah no cameras allowed (laughs) so anyway lisa we just got started we were picking michael's brain about him being a um kiss fan and he was telling us he discovered kiss in 75 when he heard rock and roll all night he was about 14 years old so that's where we're at right now, since you kind of brought the whole show to a screeching halt. I apologize. You, you were late. Killed the cheat. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay, so please continue. Please continue. Continue with your love for Kiss. Yeah. I'm sorry? Continue with your love for Kiss. Oh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess, you know, Dress to Kill, once I got the album, uh, I loved every song on it, and of course right away comes kiss alive um and i was really fortunate because that same i guess it must have been right after that tour that that, or the kiss alive album they came to waterloo iowa which is where i was living and uh, they played mackerel auditorium in waterloo that must have been 76 i suppose it must have been the destroyer tour and uh got to see them then and well, that cemented it for me, of course, seeing them live. Oh, and uh, and then Love Gun came out at, well, no, Rock and Roll Over came out after that. And, man, I really love that record a lot. And then Love Gun. So that was really my main era for Kiss. I think once they hit the uh, I Was Made for Loving You era, I was kind of kind of done. 
<laughs> well, I, I remember you saying that. So basically, you're a Kiss fan up through the the Dynasty era, which yeah, is, is not necessarily uncommon for many Kiss fans because that is seen as sort of the first swerve they took. Mm-hmm. I think so. I think for guys my age um, that grew up in the seventies with that band. Yeah, I think once, you know, I was made for loving you. That was right during the height of disco in 79. And, you know, even if you liked disco, you would never admit it to your friends. Oh, and... d- disco was <laughs> disco was the, the hated enemy of of Kiss, of a Kiss fan. Yes. And so I think that's what it was for me. I would have been 17, I suppose, or 18 when I was made for loving you came out. And it was, uh, yeah, I was appalled. It's just like, what? What? What is happening here? I just couldn't believe it. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of lost interest, I guess, at that, at that age and that stage with, with band. And then, and then, of course, after that, it, it kind of got weird in the 80s. You know, Creatures of the Night was kind of cool. Um, there was mm-hmm. a couple of cool songs there. And uh, so I think, I guess, throughout the 80s, it was kind of hit and miss for me. I would hear a song and go, okay, that's not bad. But overall, you know, of course, you know, you change, too. Once you get into your 20s, you're not a kid anymore. And so I kind of lost interest in Kiss and moved on to, you know, Ronnie James Dio. I was going to say, what, Barry Manilow? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you grew up? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Maiden. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you well, go. I mean, yeah. and we've talked about it as Kiss was going from Dynasty to Unmasked to The Elder. That's yeah. when Van Halen was coming up. That's when Iron Maiden was coming up. So all of a sudden, you as a heavy metal fan of Kiss are going, boy, it's getting awfully hard for me to defend my band here when it was. when this it other was. stuff is and coming I... out. Well, and it was so much heavier and so much more. Uh, geez, we thought Kiss was demonic in the seventies, right? And uh, and I think the metal that was coming out in the eighties. Oh my goodness, Kiss sounded like a pop band compared to what some of the stuff that was coming out. I think. We're, I'm sorry, we're laughing because Lisa almost fell off her chair. I don't know why. She's literally just I, oh, sitting. I know why. She's just sitting why. there, and she almost yeah. fell off. Yeah, totally yeah. We know. We know why. Oh my god, I'm so embarrassed. I... Oh god, this, is, this, Monday, is, this is staying in. By the do way, I get to, do I get? Do I get to see this? At yes, some point? yes. When oh, when yeah. when when we post this next week, you can watch the video of this. Oh, my god. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you know. That will make a great loop, just a, like a <laughs> with a sound effect. One of those memes. Did you yeah. see that? I yeah. I literally almost did like one. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know why. I mean, you're sitting comfortably on a chair, and all of a sudden you're like drunk and falling off of it. I don't know what happened. Like I don't know what happened. <laughs> Conti- I, I want what he's having. Yeah, what's yeah, in that coffee okay. cup, Lisa? Yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, no, I'm no just, don't apologize. You're telling this entire interview, I apologize profusely. Because, again, <laughs> imagine, Lisa, you were sitting on a bar stool and that happened. Well, that's kind of what this is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we would have been laughing at your ass on the floor of the bar. I, I, I would have hit my concrete on this Marshall amp right behind me. I would have hit my head on that, on that Marshall amp. She's prepping for tonight's activities. Yes. <laughs> so prep. I was so <laughs> Oh God, we never know where this show is gonna go. I, we I, hit the record I'm so button. Sorry. I totally That's I'm awesome. just feeling this entire I I'm just gonna sit here. <laughs> Since I've been on, I'm just, I've almost fallen off my chair. Oh, you're late. You're falling off the chair. You just want to destroy I, this episode, don't you? I, I'm, I'm not intentionally, no, not really. It's hot you know, I'm the, I'm the one that's unemployed. If anything, it should be me right now. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Lisa, just be, the, a... just be the weather girl. Sit there and look beautiful. Yeah. You can do that. You're good at that. I, <laughs> um, so then when did you get, what year did you get into radio? And how did you get into radio? 
I got into radio. I I first got back in the day. You had to have a an FCC license to even be on the radio. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, you know? they, they they weren't and hard I, to get though, were they? If I remember, I'm I'm sorry. They weren't that hard to get, if I remember. Well, you know, actually, they were back in the '70s. You actually had to go to either Minneapolis or Kansas City uh, to take an FCC test, and uh, you had to pass that test to get a license, and then. It was right during the, I think it was the spring of 79, they, the FCC did away with getting the test, and you had to apply uh, for a license. So uh, fortunately, I didn't have to take the test, So, uh, but I did get my license in the summer of 79, and then I, uh, I went to Montana because my dad was living up there. And so I went to Montana, and I'm doing construction work and uh, not liking it very much. And uh, I always wanted to be in radio, uh, just was fascinated with it, and uh, grew up listening to it, of course, and all the legendary stations on AM back in the 70s, like WLS, or, or even in Minneapolis, WDGY, Ouija. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's still on. It's still on. Yeah, which is still on. I just listened to it yesterday. Um and uh, so I uh, I ended up just harassing this radio station up in Montana uh, in the summer of uh, 1980, and uh, they 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 gave me a job. So uh, that's really all I've ever done since then. Now, uh, once you were in radio, well, how, how do I want to start this? Were you immediately working at stations where where the format, what you had to play was set and very restricted, or did you have any opportunity to kind of interject your own personal tastes? Um, well, within reason, I guess. You had to stick to the format. Um, so I couldn't slip in, you know, shock me, um, <laughs> you know, or something like that in the middle of the night. Well, I, maybe I could have, but I, I didn't want to get in too much trouble. So we did have some leeway, but uh, and I was literally playing records. That's how long ago it was. Yeah, I mean, it, you you take a vinyl vinyl LP and you'd play a track off of it. Yeah, we would either play vinyl and uh, forty fives, and I uh, I had just started in radio, and unfortunately, I was just a few months into radio when. Uh, John Lennon was killed, and I had to work the night shift, the overnight shift. Uh, that night, uh, Monday night, he was he was killed, and so I had to go on at midnight of, uh, that night and announce, you know, to talk about it all night long, and then just play tons of Beatle records and Lennon records all night. So that was quite an experience. Well, so were, were you a big Beatles fan? Did you have a lot of knowledge of the Beatles? Yeah, I was a huge Beatles fan, and uh, so that sucked being on the air that night. <laughs> well, uh, you know, my my, but, my my question was leading to, in this day and age, it would be easy to talk about anything because you just open up a laptop next to you and you hit wiki and, you know, all the knowledge yeah. is there. But back then when that happened, if you didn't have great knowledge of the Beatles, where would you be getting information to talk yeah, uh, back in those, in those days, uh, really you had to depend on United Press International or the Associated Press, because at radio stations we would have teletype machines, and basically what that would do is, uh, whether it was news or sports or anything, it would just automatically type onto paper from the UPS or from the UPS, from uh, the UPI or the AP. Uh, on the paper, you know, so you would just rip and read. And fortunately, they would do stuff like that if, you know, the Beatles, something happened like Lennon, um, you know, throughout the night, they would, uh, almost like a biography, they would pass along. So you would have some notes, I guess, uh, to read. So it looked like one of those teletype machines, basically, that just kept spitting information out, and you'd rip it and read it? That's like talking about? right. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Like, like what Les Nessman had in his office. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny because uh, they would have uh, certain things set up, like uh, the AP or a uh, UPI. So if if something tragic happened, it would ring a certain amount of time. So I guess, you know, 
if the president was shot or some crazy thing like that, it would ring. I think it was 10 times or, you know, something. So you know, it was breaking you know, something news. Urgent. Yeah, something huge was happening. And I think the night Lennon got shot, it, it probably rang seven or eight times. But that's that's still that was still in use in the nineties too. Like the Is that, that right? Yeah, because I remember when I worked at the station in like ninety one, ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, they still had the, the the dot matrix machine that would spit out the news and you'd rip it off and you'd have that's what you report off of. Oh sure. Yeah. Well yeah, but I mean yeah, I guess, keep keep in mind yeah, Early '90s, the internet was yeah. not because because yeah. because even when I started college radio in '95 '96, um, you know we had just gotten a laptop in the the station that had access to like CompuServe, and we thought, holy crap, this is the greatest thing in the world. Now we don't need you know, the, the UP, the, you know, AP and all that stuff. We can just go on to CompuServe and yeah. get whatever we want. But there was like only one yeah. person in the office who knew how to use it. <laughs> we get the news off the Friday morning quarterback. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Remember the Friday morning quarterback? No. Love, no. love the Friday morning quarterback. <laughs> FMQB. FMQB. <laughs> Radio trade. Oh, FMQB. sorry. I yeah. thought she was talking about something different. <laughs> 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 Not a football magazine, no. no. <laughs> the Friday morning goalie. Yep. The Friday morning goalie. We're just trying to make her blush. Look at her. I think she is. Yeah. I probably got myself settled in. I got. Are you? Yeah. Do you have a seatbelt on now? Yeah. Are you, sta- are you stable? I think I, I saw Brian sneak in behind you and like steady you. Well, he was giving me a fan. I said, "Tie the balls in here." He said, "Well, turn the fan on." I'm like, "What?" Well, I guess I could do that. I said I'm going to slid off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! These the you know Michael these sidekicks you hire for your shows sometimes they just. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know what? I bring entertainment. Shut up. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. So then, when you were working in radio and you started out, what was the thing that was most different about it than what you thought it was going to be? That's a good question. I guess uh, the groupies. <laughs> you know that wasn't bad either. Um, I had, you know, honestly, I, I had, I was lucky enough to where when I was a teenager, like I mean, fourteen, fifteen, I was harassing the local radio stations, and there was a DJ, and he was cool, and so I would call and request songs, and told him I wanted to be in radio, and. Uh, he would let me come down to the station and kind of shadow him. Oh, um, so, cool. so fortunately, by the time I actually got in radio, I kind of already knew what was going on because uh, I, w- I would watch him so much. And uh, I would go down there, you know, a couple, three times a week wow. uh, just to hang out with him. Yeah, he was way cool to let me do that. And that really, once I did that, of course, oh, man, you know, I had the bug. I had to, I had to be in radio. Oh, yeah. So I think by the course. time I... By the time I got that first job, I, I kind of knew what it, what uh, what was going to happen, you know. Well, so then, how did from your perception, how did the radio as as a whole, maybe not just the specific stations you worked at, how did they view a band like Kiss at that point? I'm assuming they no one wanted anything to do with them. I think, um, and of course, this was '80 when I got in, but. Um, I think even in the, uh, honestly, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking I did top 40 from 80 to like 86 or 87. And even at top 40, boy, there weren't very many singles uh, or top 40 hits for Kiss during that era. They had a few, like Tears for Falling and stuff. You know, no, and it's funny because even like Tears for Falling, uh, that stuff was day parted at most top 40 stations, which means... You know, you probably didn't play it during the day because the program director thought it was too heavy. <laughs> um, day, daytime was prime, then, was your prime real estate somewhat, like morning and then afternoon drive time were your prime, and then they would put like not so popular songs on the overnight slot. Right? Yeah. yeah right. Yep. Well, nights I've always, or overnights. 
Yep. I've always been curious why certain songs take off and certain songs don't. You know, like I would have thought that Shandy would have been a huge hit. Same with uh, Cheap Trick's song, Tonight It's You. And neither one of them got any airplay in the U.S. And, it, and I always am wondering if that's just because of poor work ethic on the part of the labels or was there really a pushback in radio in general that there's just certain bands we're not going to play? I mean, and, and, and Michael, I wanted to I wanted to make a comment or question. And this kind of relates to Tommy, but back to something like Tears Are Falling, you know, is 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 that song day parted more so because of the image that it's kiss and less because the song is heavy because i don't know maybe i'm jaded here but tears are falling is not a heavy song when that came out but just the name kiss connotates something that a lot of average people just don't understand don't get don't like and i think that was part of the challenge Kiss was always facing is people judge the band by the name, by the image, not by the music. I think, you know, uh, at least with my experience, especially top 40, if you're truly a top 40 station, um, anytime in the 80s, especially the 80s, I think, um, you know, you're playing Madonna and Prince and Kenny Loggins and uh, Cindy Lauper and, and here comes a Kiss record. It just really doesn't even fit your format. Um, so it would automatically just be day parted for nights, I think, just because it didn't really sound right on the station uh, the rest of the time. And, and, and may, is, it, maybe this is why something like um, 104 worked so well, because at the same time, it, it, it wouldn't, Tears Are Falling wouldn't work on a top 40 station. Somebody like a KQRS isn't picking it up either because that's not classic rock. I mean, that's, yeah. y- you know. Well, even all, KQ all, all, in the... Go ahead. I was going to say, KQ in the 80s, I remember during their Noontime Nuggets feature that they used to run, this would have been 86, 87, and I would flip over to KQ and they're playing the Beach Boys. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's it Back was always then. the Beach Boys, the Doors, the Who, the Brothers. Yeah. Mellencamp. So Kiss or anything in the vein of Kiss didn't fit the rock stations. It also didn't fit the top forty stations. All of those bands, not just Kiss, were in this kind of like Neverland type of. They don't fit anywhere. And and that's why one when 104 came in and that's all you played it was like oh my god there's finally a place playing this because I I remember when KQ started doing their metal show like on Friday nights or something and it was like holy crap I can actually hear Heavens on Fire on KQ granted it's one night a week for one hour but it, it I don't know yeah. it just seemed very weird that. In that period for radio, especially for Kiss, they didn't fit anywhere. They really didn't seem well, to fit. And that was the, and you know, the funny thing about a lot of those bands at that time, even Rats, Round and Round, or, you know, whatever the records were that were big hits, photographed by Def Leppard. Scorpions. Was a, mm-hmm. Scorpions, Rocky Like a Hurricane. Yep. A lot of that, honest to God, and I, you know, it's funny because at the time we hated them. And I'll explain that in a second here. But if it was not for MTV, I don't think those records would have been hits at all. Um, the videos well, yeah, especially really since changed the, everything. Well, yeah, especially since the uh, the stations weren't playing that stuff until MTV made it so big that you almost had to. The the oddest Absolutely. thing, yeah, the oddest thing for me in radio, and I'm sorry to all the listeners because Mike and I talk about KQ a lot because it's a source of you know, pain and reference. But but uh, let's be honest, every every major market has their version of KQ. It's whatever your major rock station, classic rock station in your big, in your market. That's it. Right. But now they're playing Poison and Blondie and Motley Crue, all these bands that they would have never touched back in the 80s because they played classic rock. 
and now they're calling this stuff classic rock. It's just kind of bizarre how it's all come full circle. So please explain to us why all that stuff was hated. Well, I, I was going to say the, the, the MTV reference. I think for all of us in radio, uh, we hated MTV because uh, it ended up to be the record companies would give the videos to MTV before they would service the records to radio. And suddenly MTV's got exclusive videos, and they would make a big deal out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they had the exclusive new Kiss video. Well, shit, we didn't even have the record. Well, is, is, so, is, that, is that what led to, like, radio stations grabbing the audio off of the video, playing it on the air, and then getting the cease and desist that you can't be playing the audio? We never ran into that uh, at anything I've ever worked with. But I did hear of stuff like that. And I, I have to admit, there's been a couple of times in my career where I did. I would go on and I would do that with Madden games um, as recently as the 2000s when uh, I can't remember what, what year it was. But when EA Sports released like Madden 2006 or whatever it was, uh, they had a Godsmack song, two Godsmack songs that were on the soundtrack for Madden. But we didn't have them. And uh, that was a pretty big core artist for the station. So I came home, and I had a copy of the game. And I got out my VCR, and I recorded the audio, and then ran to the station and dubbed that in so that we could play the song because they didn't service it to radio. You know, I I remember um, we ran the syndicated radio show metal shop on our college station oh, yeah. um, and i remember one of the episodes they had the i think it was the exclusive debut of ace fraley's new single from his first uh-huh. solo album i don't know if it was into the night with would, would that or maybe yeah i think yeah. it was into the night yeah. but yeah. that that yeah. was in the metal shop and you know for those of you who don't understand metal shop is sent out as a vinyl album it's just an album you yeah. drop the needle and it plays it's got all the audio and the commercials and everything are in there and i was just like fuck i want to play this ace fraley song on my own but atlantic isn't servicing the single yet so i had to figure out a way to tape record the single off of the metal shop vinyl album do a little editing because they freaking put like a budweiser commercial that tommy as we were talking about they they played you know they hit the post with a budweiser commercial going into the ace fraley single and i'm like god damn it i don't want the budweiser commercial on this song yeah it was was, there was just weird shit like that that would go on during all the time but this was during the late 80s for me and they would do that on purpose so you couldn't you couldn't do it you couldn't steal the song right (laughs) yeah definitely and i again i think that's where uh I think radio really resented MTV, uh, certainly early on, because you're right, it did force radio to play certain songs uh, because the videos were so huge. And MTV was such a crazy thing at the time. You know, you'd get requests for these songs. You didn't even you didn't even have them. Um, right. So it was pretty irritating for a while. Well, and, what, you know, one of the things I was having this discussion with a friend of mine, Bren, this morning about music and legacy acts and these different bands and one of the bands we were discussing was guns and roses and i think it's interesting how they had a lot of different songs that people know but i would say one of their best known songs is sweet child of mine and it seems like it's one of the dirty dozen that all these local bands that play covers have to play for people to go out and see them and i wonder how much of that was driven because of mtv over any type of of airplay well, I, you know, I guess personally, I was right there at the beginning for Guns N' Roses, so we played the living snot out of them. Okay, uh, well, right. I'm just using that as an example. Just for all the different artists that have come and gone, it seems like one song can really make you. Like, same with Def Leppard. Even though they've had a, a myriad of hits, Pour Some Sugar On Me is the one song that seems to be that epic song yeah. that has created a career it just seems to me that those songs are different than say rock and roll all night which is just as much of a career hit for kiss as those other ones are 
for those bands. No question. Yeah, no question about that. I mean, uh, and rock and roll all night. Uh, it's interesting because the hit was the version from the live album, not the right. studio version. Right. Which is considerably uh, better, in my opinion. Yes, me too. And uh, but I, you know, I think at the time uh, I was just happy to hear Kiss on the radio. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, it's interesting uh, between the the MTV era. There's no question that MTV made a lot of hit records uh, because of those videos and influenced uh, radio greatly because of the video airplay. So, 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 so were you then seeing radio stations basically starting to play Scorpions and Rat? They had to start playing that stuff, even if it was a metal show at night, because it was just all over MTV. Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, and I know from, uh, I was down in Arkansas from 82 to 85, and uh, we were just a, you know, straight ahead top 40 station. You know, you're playing all the a flock of seagulls and all the stuff that was on top 40 back in the early 80s. But you would have these Scorpions records and Rat and things of that nature that were brand new artists, well, to radio. Yeah, and uh, but they were day parted again. We played the Scorpions, but it was only after seven o'clock at night. It just was too heavy. My program director just thought it was too heavy. And how do you play Madonna and Scorpions on the same radio station? And and yet, and and yet now, anything, now uh, nowadays that happens. Nowadays you can yeah. you can listen to a yeah. station that goes from Madonna into Guns and Roses. I know it's it just it kills me. <laughs> so then, so peel peel the curtain back a little bit for some of us that have called in and, and requested songs before. Let's say you're sitting at one of your top forty radio um, places and you're playing all the hits and you're going through your program and you do allow a certain number of people to call in and make a request. Let's say someone calls in with a somewhat of an oddball request of a song that you really really like. Would you ever be chastised for playing that song? Did they watch you that closely, or did you have a certain amount of ability to throw a few things in? Uh, well, I guess it definitely depends on the song. Um, but if, if it was a, if it was a song we were playing, then um, I guess it would be okay. Um, if it was a song we definitely did not play. Uh, then no, you'd probably get a phone call from the program director. And what would he usually say? <laughs> do, it again, do, do it again. Do it again, and you're fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much, very much like that. <laughs> well, that's what we got because I was wondering how serious is that. Well, I, you know, I my my story about I've gotten fired uh, for breaking format, and it was an accident. Uh, and it's funny because it was at 104 in Minneapolis. But it was before I worked at that station three times. So it was before the uh, Hot Rock and 104 era. Um, so K, uh, KJJL was a classic rock station at the time. It was called KJO 104. And I was on the air uh, working nights, uh, 6 to 10 p.m. there. And one night I got distracted. I can't remember what in the world was going on, but maybe I had a girl in the studio. I don't know. Um, but I was Lisa? playing Jackson Brown. I think Lisa was there, yeah, and nice. uh, <laughs> she fell off a chair. And uh, <laughs> no. um, so I was playing a Jackson Brown song, and I don't know why, but I I played another Jackson Brown song right after that. And it wasn't it wasn't Tuesday when you can do two for Tuesdays. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Well, and I got fired for that. Really. Yeah, okay. I got fired for playing that. So I want to go in a little deeper here with you on this particular subject because I've debated this with a friend of mine. When it comes to FCC rules, because I don't know how else to ask this question, is there some type of a rule in effect that you cannot play any more than a certain number of songs by one specific artist at a time? So, like, could you literally, if you wanted to just play, I don't know, side one of Destroyer, could you just drop the needle and let her go? Yes. As far as I know, I, I don't think, unless that's changed recently, and I don't believe it has, but well, I've because, heard that story before, because but that's impossible. There's, there's stations that would do album sides. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's why I was. A format or a program. I mean, you couldn't do that in regular rotation. You couldn't just like pick a side and go with it. Well, I, again, I think well, I'm not talking about the program. Or but I'm not asking about if it, the program director would be pissed off or not. My question is this: Let's say it's the middle of the afternoon, Michael, and you're like. Screw it, man. I haven't listened to frickin' Fair Warning in forever, and everybody that can hear me within 50,000 watts of this power is going to listen to side one of Fair Warning. Could you have dropped the needle, played the whole thing without an FCC backlash? Without an FCC backlash, yes. I would have lost my job. Yeah. Right, but, and that but I understand. It because, yeah, it wouldn't be because of the FCC, though. Okay. The reason I ask that is because I have a friend that has a radio share, show here in town, and, and that's what he believes to be true, that you can't play more than a certain number of songs by a specific artist in a time slot. And I'm like, that doesn't sound right, but I don't know enough about I don't it. Think it's, I don't think that's FCC regulated. I think that's more station regulated than it is FCC. I don't think it has anything to do with... Yeah, because when Chris Cornell dies, what, you can't play an hour tribute? Right. Yeah, that's a great you point. You play an hour of Soundgarden or something, or you know, I did that when uh, Lane Staley died. I played an hour of Alice in Chains. Okay. But that was cool. And, but that was cool with the program director. Yeah, well, I was the program director. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would be a yes. Yeah, that would be a yes. unless you unless you fired yourself for insubordination. <laughs> right. He took, he, took, he took himself into the jock lounge and slapped his face. That's right. <laughs> yeah, like I've seen in Liar Liar where he kicks his own ass at the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't believe that that's uh, an okay. official FCC rule or anything. Okay. And so, if it is, man, have I broken that over the years? Well, so, yeah. How, how much would requests potentially play into, you know, the, there, there's always the saying, Call and request our song because if we get a lot of requests, they're going to add us. Does that have any impact? No, and it didn't on me. And I'll tell you why. Um, because, and I've gone through this with so many bands over the years where uh, nationally they will get on their Facebook or whatever and say, hey, call these radio stations and request us. Well, now you've got people that do not live in your market. Right. You know, if I'm in Minneapolis oh. and I got somebody in Atlanta calling me about this hot new band that they're in love with, they're they're in the fan club. Um, so it means nothing to me yeah. uh, because they don't live in Minneapolis or whatever market. You know, mm -hmm. if those calls are coming from your listeners, well, that carries a little more weight. But a lot of times I'd be on the air and, you know, I'm getting, you know, of course, we have caller ID so I'm getting all these phone calls from area codes that are nowhere near here uh, asking to play a certain band. And, you know, it's just their fan club, you know. Oh, yeah. It's not that so no, I never. It, it, if anything, it turned me off to the band. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I remember. Um, so I was working with Kiss at Kiss Online, and it was when um, Carnival of Souls was released. All right. E e terrible album. Thank God Mark's right. not here because we can trash it all we want. Or just um, thank God Mark's not here. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, Mercury Records at the time, you know, even though they had hard, they were doing their reunion, Mercury Records did some promotion behind Carnival of Souls. And I was working, or I was in contact with the radio promo guy out of New York who was heading it all up. And I was like, listen, what do you want me to do? The, the website is here for you to use if you want me to put the word out i'll put the word out and, and i distinctly remember him saying listen don't say anything unless i tell you to say anything because what i don't want to have happen is have a program director call me pissed off that a hundred people from around the country are calling him every hour asking for a kiss song to be played and because he's now annoyed he's not gonna play it because right. he yeah. got pissed off yeah, well, and that did happen quite a bit. There were bands, usually not of the stature of Kiss. Usually they were smaller, up-and-coming bands that you would get this going on. Uh, we never got that with Kiss. I remember when Jungle came out, um, I believe we did play it for a while. 
But most people didn't care, I think. Uh, you know, we're playing Godsmack and well, maybe not 97, but, you know, we're playing whatever was hot in 97. Uh, and Kiss just definitely was not hot, at radio anyway. And, uh, you know, we didn't play that song very long. I think, you know, actually, uh, Psycho Circus was uh, a much bigger record for, for me, at least, uh, as a programmer. We played a, a couple of songs off the uh, Psycho Circus record, and, of course, the title track. I, I was pretty excited about that song. I thought it was the best thing they had done in quite some time. Now, I, I was going to ask you, in your experience, what was the Kiss album or song that got the most reaction for you at radio? Was that Psycho Circus? Well, yeah, probably, because I guess uh, there wasn't a lot. I guess uh, I guess Crazy Nights, what was that, 88? Um, so that was kind of big that summer of 88, uh, Crazy Nights was. And Raisin uh, to there was a couple. That was a big one on radio. But Which but again, you, re, reason to live. But you know, I was going to say uh, yeah. is a lot of crazy nights could be potentially attributed to MTV because that's when MTV's daily right. top ten call in was all over the place. And no I remember doubt. crazy crazy nights was getting a lot of love in their top ten. A lot of love. You kept crazy calling. Nights, definitely. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I, that's Brand, why. Brandle had a <laughs> robo caller. <laughs> And you're right, uh, Lisa. Reason to Live was uh, pretty big, and uh, we played Good Girl Gone Bad off that record too. Really? Wow, you That's went cool. deep. That's a great song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that would have been that would have been in Minneapolis too. We played that. Now, and then what was after that? Hot in the shade or hot something? Hot in the shade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, between yeah. there was then you, uh, the, then you had a Michael then you had Michael Bolton helping out. So forever. you know, that's, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But forever. but again, that that for, forever went like top ten. For oh, Kiss. I bet, yeah. I mean, it was, but that was also when um, ballads were. So this is this is an interesting segue. We all know that that especially when it came to videos, um, a lot of bands like Kiss lead with a rockin' song, and then you follow up the the. The the formula is you then follow up with the power ballad because that's going to then cross you over. That's right. Did that happen in radio as well? Was the same thing followed in radio? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It still does. People will say, how can they release that song first? That This other song's way better. And it's like, well, yeah, they're never going to lead with the best song first. They're going to come with a good song, and then they'll, you know, they just try to stretch that album out as long as they can. You know, a perfect example is um, on Revenge. Uh, they released Domino on AOR, right. and then they released um, Every Time I Look at You. And that crossed over to to, um, to the top 40 stations, which I thought yeah. was interesting because a lot of my like my cousins who didn't like Kiss, they start, they're like, oh, that song by Kiss, that Every Time I Look at You is so amazing. I'm like, where are you hearing this? And it's, it's on the top 40 station in Pittsburgh. So I thought that was interesting how it's in the same album, you have two different releases on two different stations and you're reaching a huge audience. But I'm surprised, though, that if you don't come out of the gate with your very best song, that it might not, it might put you in a situation where the, the album dies on the vine. I don't know that it, it works as much like that today uh, as it did then. And back then, you could get away with it, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, was, there just I was, wasn't I say, as much competition. Your, your first single, you're right, Tommy, may not have worked as well, but you always were going to go to a second single. It wasn't a matter yeah. of if the first single doesn't work, everything is dead and it's over. If Unless the first the single elder. didn't work, they're still going for that second single. Yeah, they're counting on it a lot more now. Did they do a second single for The Elder, or was it just A World Without Heroes and then they were done? Boy, boy, that's we never way played back. a thing off that record, so I don't know. No one did. Hey, one right. of the heroes was on AM station on KDKA AM. Wow, that's how, crazy. It, it was. How much in in radio are you influence driven, pushed by 
the enthusiasm or the interest of the record label when it comes to the artist and playing something meaning if if if, if the label isn't doesn't care about it do you ignore it uh if any if you know if you were personally a fan of it and the label it was like crickets i would call the label going hey how come you guys aren't pushing this you know uh, and it always it always mystified me, and there was always bands like that throughout time that, uh, you know, that would release a great song, they'd be on a major, and yet there wouldn't really be much push. And I always wondered why. And I assume that had to do with management of the band. Uh, maybe the label is uh, going to drop this band anyway, so they don't care. They're just doing a contractual obligation thing. So I think there was a number of different reasons for those things to happen, but I would say it still happens. Sure. Michael, in the, seven, yeah. like the 80s and 90s, the, the, the record label and the radio, there was a lot, of, like, a lot of politics going on there. Is that still like it is today? I've been out of radio for some time now, but I remember like early 90s, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of politics going on. What do you mean by politics? A lot of politics. Yeah, like a lot of, um... well, go ahead, Michael. Well, I was going to say, even late, there were certain levels. Look at Geffen. Geffen in the 80s and the 90s, uh, especially the 80s. Um, if you were on Geffen, it just seemed like a guarantee that it was going to do well. You know, they had the Teslas, and they had all these bands that were just hitting hit after hit. And the label was all, you know, of course, Guns N' Roses. So, I mean, uh, everything that was on Geffen, uh, seemed to be a, a hit at the time. And I suppose, uh, you know, because Geffen had some strings, they could say, well, we'll give you this exclusive uh, Guns N' Roses track if you'll add this record. So they would play politics. You know, a lot of labels would do stuff like that. Was there ever politics, I guess, like in the reverse fashion of we don't want you to play this? Don't play this track? No. Not that I ever remember. I just don't think they cared. Um, you might hear, you know, if I added something on a label that they were not pushing specifically, I might get a call from the label going, hey, we saw you added that blah, blah, blah record this week. You know, we're really not promoting that. Yeah, well, I don't care. My listeners want to hear it. <laughs> So, so I didn't really care if they liked it or not. I would just add it. How do you know your listeners want to hear it? Would you do focus groups, listening groups? Would you do local testing? Yes, and uh, we would also monitor record stores. And of course, this is back in the day, but you would call the local record store or even Best Buy. You know, even in the in the nineties. You just get a relationship with whoever was stocking the shelves there, and and uh, kind of paying attention to what was selling. Or I would just I would just go to Best Buy and uh, go to an artist that I knew we were playing to see how much product was there, and always smiled when there was no copies left. So you knew you were doing something. You know, you were sold out. When did SoundScan come out again? Was it eighty? That was like ninety two. Was it ninety two? Okay. Yeah, ninety one, ninety two. During your during your tenure as a DJ, can you pick? I mean, I don't want you to throw anyone under the bus, but I do. Um, <laughs> just out of curiosity, was there ever like a song that you played that got hugely popular, and every time you played it, you're like, "How the fuck is this popular?" Wow, that's too big of a list. <laughs> yeah, I figured. But can you give me just one or two that just blew up? And you're just like, "What in the hell?" I don't get well, it. Well, I. Well, I was going to say, uh, gosh, you know, uh, uh, well, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of the opposite uh, examples to be, to be honest with you. Oh, and I one got of them, a list of those. Well, I was going to say one of them is still of the night by Whitesnake, um, which was just a humongous song for us in Minneapolis in the summer mm -hmm. of 87. Yeah. And, uh, you know, nationally the record wasn't doing too much at the time. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, as 1988 broke and suddenly Guns N' Roses is breaking nationally, we've already been on the record six months and now it's starting to break. 
And it was the same with Still of the Night. I, I was stunned that that was a top 10 pop record, Still of the Night. And yeah. I just couldn't believe it. So it was stuff like that that really amazed me, uh, how, how Geffen, it was on Geffen, how they got that record to go top 10 uh, when U2 and all these other pop artists, well, U2, you know, the Joshua Tree era, they could do no yeah. wrong. Yeah. Uh, but it was still amazing to see a band like Whitesnake. Even Here I Go Again with a ballad. I mean, that was a little more understandable, but still of the night. But that was all video. Uh, that was all because of the video. video. That, that's right. Well, there you go. There's MTV's yeah, influence there's MTV. again. And it's not even yeah. the band in the video. It's just Tawny Katane rolling from one car to the other. You're just like, okay, I like this song. Yep. Exactly. Song and that totally did that. Would have been and how much of how much of it ended up being regional? Because that 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 made me think of a couple of songs that KQ still plays in heavy rotation to this day. One of the songs I absolutely love that they play is a song called "Dreams" by Barry Goudreau. As many oh. people may know, it was the guitar player from Boston. So this sounded just like a Boston record. Bad Delp was on on vocals. Everyone thought it was Boston, but it's not. But yet, when I talked to friends that say live out on the east coast i mentioned that song who they like boston like what are you talking about they'd never heard of it before that very good row album came out in 80 yeah and it, it was on epic just like boston mm -hmm. i think it was on portrait it was on the, the side label but it was owned yeah. by epic um and we played the snot out of dreams and yeah, yeah. you could have sort of got it was a boston record yeah. Um, but it did not do well. It did not do well. I don't think they promoted it very well. And, um, you know, people just didn't know who the hell he was. Um, and I don't think they marketed it very well. So I would say that was a, really more of an example of, of the record company just not knowing what to do with that record. But but how do, how do you guys end up playing, playing it so much, say, in Minneapolis, but it just doesn't take off in other areas? What happens in a situation like that? That is that literally comes down to the local program director. So he I heard mean, it, there's... picked up on it, and thought, "Hey, this is a good song. Let's play it." Yeah, I think you know, uh, you know, the a song like that. It was just so obvious. If you're, um, especially in the Midwest, Boston was just huge here. Still are, and uh, and I would say just that sound. I, it was a no brainer. I thought to play that song. Yeah. Uh, whereas maybe in other markets, they just I don't know. It's not Boston. I don't know. Maybe they thought it was this guy Coffee in Boston. I don't know. <laughs> Shoot, I don't know why that record wasn't Shooting a Shooting Star comes to mind as another band uh, that was very big, I think, regionally. I mean, they were huge in the Midwest. Minneapolis, again, all over, all over their album. But outside of the Midwest, you bring up Shooting Star to rock fans, and they're like, yeah, I think I've heard of them. Head East is another band that was just huge in the Midwest. And uh, just never really got any traction anywhere else. That one I don't get. I'm sorry. I, the, the, <laughs> I don't get it. The freaking stack of pancakes on the uh, whatever. See, that I, one I that was get. a big record for me as a kid. Yeah. That had an East record. Oh, my God. Oh, people I was all love them. them. Man, Cowbell. Never been any reason. My, Michael, right. let, me, let me go back to, to Kiss here before we get our listeners yelling at us going, hey, you knuckleheads, this is a Kiss show. Um, <laughs> how much promotion do you remember the label putting behind Kiss when it came to pushing it to radio compared to other acts? Um, I don't think they were treated any differently. I don't, you know, from my view. Um, and I'll tell you when Psycho Circus, especially just the, you know, recent, I guess, well, it's 20 years ago, but, uh, I know boy, Psycho Circus was huge promotion. I mean, they just really promoted the hell out of that record, uh, for good reasons. You know, it was kind of the, the band getting back together type of thing. And, um, so there was a big promotion from, from the label on that. But it worked. Uh, I mean, it really seemed to work because the Psycho Circus, if I recall, I don't know if it was number one at, at rock radio, but certainly top ten with airplay. And uh, there were a few things on that record that got a lot of airplay. And I think it was because of the promotion. And, of course, the music has to be there, too, and it was. And uh, so I would say uh, I don't know that there was any different promotion 
uh, for Kiss than any other band that was out there. They just threw it out there, and I think uh, because of the branding of Kiss, um, they didn't have to do a lot of promotion. Do you, again, from the radio side of things, was it a challenge? Did you see it as a challenge when a new Kiss album, let's use Crazy Nights maybe as an example, is released and being pushed, but it's going up against Bon Jovi and Def Leppard and Guns N' Roses uh, and Whitesnake? Does, does that become an issue? Not at that time. I don't think it, uh, you know, honestly, in 87 when that came out, um, I don't think, uh, you know, Kiss wasn't looked at as old guys. I think it was still, it's Kiss. It was still hip. So I didn't, I don't recall ever thinking, oh God, Kiss, geez. You know, I just, that wasn't the mentality then. Now, maybe when Psycho Circus was pushed, you know, 20 years later, it was just like, oh my God, they got a new album out. Really? Do you ever um, recall but, any anybody in radio, even just friends or acquaintances, you know, kind of in conversation going, oh, my God, it's Kiss. I, you know, the, these guys in makeup, they got a new album and they want me to play it. I mean, do you ever recall any resistance from other people? Not, not with the, not really. I, I guess maybe in the early 90s when they went through that era with the, the Carnival of Souls record or the. Um, you know, maybe the early 90s stuff, Revenge. By then, I think people were kind of wearing on it. Um, you had grunge happening. You just went through the Guns N' Roses era. And now you've got Alice in Chains and Nirvana. And here's Kiss coming out with a new record. So I think that's when I first was kind of like, eh, no. <laughs> no. It just didn't fit with everything else that was on the radio. You, know, you got Gin Blossoms out there. You got Spin Doctors. You, it was an odd time for rock radio, and Kiss was definitely not cool, I guess, at that time. Well, you know, and so Kiss not being cool, what I wanted to share with you is is, is my little story as a fan calling um, KQ. So this is back, Creatures of the Night, and then Lick It Up. Okay. Um, you know, I call KQ, Creatures of the Night comes out. If you're a KISS fan, all of a sudden you're like, this is freaking heavy metal. KISS yeah. is back. This album yep. is freaking smoking. You know, th forget about the last three albums. This is it. Um, you yep. know, I call call KQ and, you know, request I Love It Loud. And, and basically I just did it for shits and giggles because I knew no way in hell even though they, quote, brought the band to town for the concert, they're not going to play I Love It Loud. They're not playing Creatures of the Night. You know, they're playing The Doors. Um, right. You know, and again, I call the request line, make the request, and they take the request, and, you know, that's I can pretty much hear the paper being crumpled up and thrown into the garbage can before the guy even hangs up the phone on me. <laughs> you know, next year, Lick It Up comes out. Again, a really freaking solid great album by kiss yeah yeah big difference the makeup is gone Call, yes. and and now kqrs is playing lick it up they're there it, it's been added to the station they're playing it and i call them as a fan and i play stupid and i get the guy on the phone and it's like what's what's that lick it up song that's fucking great who is that and i remember the the dj going well, that's Kiss. They took their makeup off. Don't they sound great now? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Still just thinking, you, 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 uh, you, I don't know, I should have said, you dumbass. This is the same band yeah. a year ago that had makeup on and had just as heavy a song that sucked because they had makeup on. Right. You know, so, right. you know, I guess... I don't know what I want to get your feelings or opinions on it. It feels like to to me as a fan and other fans, that's always been the battle Kiss has, has had to wage. Is well, you know, the, I don't, the, the, you know, the makeup's the I, problem. The makeup's not the problem. The, you know, it, it's yeah, I never I never got the vibe that it was a problem. Um, I can tell you when Creatures came out, that was eighty two, mm -hmm. and. And again, uh, you know, maybe not. There were there were AOR stations, but not a lot of them. And I know KQ was, you know, one of a few back then where were they were 
album rock or whatever. Um, so most of the success really had to come from top 40. And, uh, you know, nothing on Creatures was going to make top 40. I Love It Loud wasn't going to get there. No. but And, but there, the... and there, there was no video airplay really too much on MTV of that song. Um, but Lick It Up was different. You know, it was a big media circus when they took off the makeup. And I know yeah. that horrible Unmasked record um, was there, but... But really, Lick It Up was is really like the big first thing they did without the makeup. And uh, it, it, it did have a different sound because Vinny's on that record. And um, I don't know, it just seemed to Kiss had more energy and more life and the, the songs were better. Um, and of course, then again, you had you had a ton of airplay on MTV. And right. I think that definitely made the big difference for Kiss on that record. But but does KQ sell records or what what is their purpose then? If Top Forty helps sell records, then what is KQ as a classic rock station playing deep cuts and all of that? What do they do? Do they help sell back catalog? Because I mean, you can't say that they haven't turned I don't know hundreds of thousands of kids on to Led Zeppelin who would have never heard of them before. Well, KQ was a AOR station back in those days. They weren't classic rock. Okay. So they, they really weren't classic rock. Oh, man, probably not until the 90s. Because even when I was there working against them in Minneapolis, uh, John Lassman and I would go head-to-head -head at night. We both mm -hmm. worked 7 to midnight. Yep. And uh, we would fight each other to see who could get the uh, White Snake record on first, you know, stuff <laughs> like that. Um, so they were definitely very active in the 80s. Uh, and really, they were the only rock station in Minneapolis for a long time back in the 80s, you know, before JJO came on. Yeah. Um, so the, really, they were the place to hear all those songs, the Kiss songs or Def Leppards or anything that was new that was rock. Uh, they were the place to hear it. Now, sadly, um, and radio's changed a lot, too, guys. I mean, uh, yeah. KQ was playing Beach Boys during their Noontime Nuggets feature. Even back yeah. in the mid eighties, yeah, um, they wouldn't play it today, but they did then. Mm -hmm. um, but they were playing. I remember the last man and I, uh, when the new Europe album came out, Superstitious. This would have been eighty eight, I think. And uh, I had a good relationship with the guy at Epic Records in town, and somehow I got a leaked copy of the Superstitious record. Somehow, <laughs> of course. Yeah, somehow, somehow got a copy of that. And I knew KQ did not have it. So I'm literally on the air every hour that night. And of course, this is Europe, for God's sake. Um, uh, but I'm on the air every hour that night sneaking in a brand new Europe song. It's not exactly like Kiss or Guns N' Roses, but at the time, it was kind of a big deal. Well, yeah, because um, you got, the, you got the, the edge over KQ. That's right. And I remember Lastman was pissed and he called me up on the request line. Where did you get that, dude? Where did you get that New Europe record? He was so pissed off that we had it <laughs> and he did not. And I, and of course, I'm not supposed to have it. So I lied and said, I don't know what you're talking about, John. Uh, <laughs> I played a I played a deep cut off an old Europe album, but I don't have anything brand new. Ew. And then the Maybe next hour I play hard. another new song. But you know, if, to... if if something like that happens, does that put you know would would KQ call the, the label up and go, uh, you know, we can't have that shit happen. If we're we're going to stop playing your other bands because you, know, you, this you, is, this... you gave this to the, our competitor. I mean, does that shit happen? Yes, it did then. It doesn't happen today because it doesn't happen anymore. You can't give a station something exclusive, really. Everything goes out to everybody at the same time now. I mean, it's all digital right. and downloads, you know. But back in those days, um, geez, I sound like an old man. Um, but yeah. it was true, though, because, uh, you know, if you had a good relationship with a guy at a label, and, hey, buddy, old pal, uh, could you send me that a day early before KQ gets it, you know? And uh, sometimes that worked. And uh, that Europe album... I can't remember how we got it early, but of course it was very anticipated at the time, just because the hooker, final countdown, you know, a, was right after the final countdown. Would a hooker usually deliver that new record? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> well, <laughs> that could have happened a couple of times. I think the Vinnie Vincent record, the Vinnie Vincent invasion record, all systems go. Uh, I think they delivered that with a tank. <laughs> I mean, it was that was a crazy time. That's amazing. Um, but uh, the record promotion was a lot more fun back in those days. That's when they had they had money. That's when it was yeah. a lot of fun. But I you know, there are. I was lucky to be in radio during that time. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be in it now. Right. Well, it was a crazy time, no doubt. But there are still some interesting programming that's left, like the local station here, 93X, they're real heavy. So you'll hear them play stuff like Stone Temple Pilots and Ozzy Osbourne, and then they'll play stuff by you know, Trivium and some of the newer bands. And that seems to be doing very, very well. Uh, that's they're very yeah, consistent. That's like yeah, the new rock station now. You what? Sorry, go ahead, Michael. Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to say 93X does pretty well up there. They've changed quite a bit. They're not as heavy as they used to be uh, in some ways. They they ended up leaning a little alternative for a while. I don't know if they've gotten back to the harder stuff. but um, I think they have again, because at that, least – go ahead. Is that right? Good. Well, well when I listen be, – cause... Yeah, because when I listen to it, I hear a lot of the bands I'm seeing at these festivals now. So they're playing Hailstorm, and they're playing Trivium, and they're playing uh, In This Moment, and they're playing all this stuff. But then they're also playing stuff that goes back, you know, cla classic metal-type music. So you'll still hear uh, older Iron Maiden, um, you know, on it as well. It seems like, I don't know, from my perspective, it seems like a real good mix. Well, they do well. 93X has done well since they came on. And uh, and they've gone through changes over the years. But, yeah, I think uh, they still sound pretty good. I haven't listened to them for a while. But uh, I know any time I'm up near Minneapolis, I definitely have to tune them in. Well, and the kids are hearing it somewhere. Because when I go to these festivals, they're Tommy, singing Tom, those the songs. The kids. The kids are hearing it. <laughs> well, when they're 15... Well, they're 15, 17 years old, and they're crowd surfing over the barrier. They're kids. You don't do that? Yeah. You're not a kid anymore, no, Tommy? You don't do that? I should I should crowd surf. Yes, you can you? Do it, do it once and get a picture. Yeah. Oh, no, I'll, I'll do a Facebook Live. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. yeah. But my point is, is that these fans know these songs, all of them. So they're hearing them somewhere, and it sure as hell ain't on MTV. Oh, it's internet. I was going to say, and it's uh, sad, sadly, I mean, as somebody who loves radio, they're probably not listening on radio either. As, Spotify. As, it's Spotify. It's it's online. Yeah. It's YouTube. It's YouTube. And I, I, I'm going to sound like an old guy here because I am, but uh, I do miss the days in the 80s when you had to listen to the radio to hear things. You just had to. There was mm -hmm. no other way to get it. And radio was so wonderful because of that, because you had the exclusive. If you wanted to hear the new Kiss or anything like that, uh, anything new, you had to listen to the radio. Um, the even if MTV was going to debut the video, you'd have to wait for hours, perhaps, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to see it. Whereas you could call the radio station, maybe they'd throw it on for you. So, Well, and now isn't uh, it kind of talk radio has become that? Yeah, it's changed so much, you know over the years you know as much as technology has hurt the radio stations i also feel that when you can stream your favorite local station live i think that's a huge benefit because mm -hmm. when people yeah. who such as myself you know, misses their local radio station it's awesome to be able to go to iHeartRadio and stream it live so in a way where the internet and the computers and all that stuff has hindered radio in a way it's it's been amazing for people that want to hear it outside their state. So for me, I love it. Well, I probably just love iHeartRadio. The, the technology, I... yeah, the technology today is is just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I've been on the beach now for eight months, so uh, it gives me an opportunity to listen to a lot of different radio, and it is great because, of course, back in the day, you had to literally travel to those cities to hear the, those radio stations. And if you ventured out of their wattage. Yeah, so. that's well, right. Again, so you know, it, and as a kid, I, you know, growing up in Minnesota, I, as much as I listened to KQ, I was always envious of my cousins in St. Louis who could listen to KC. It's like, oh, my 
God, I wish I could listen to that. Or especially mm-hmm. during the 80s, how come I can't listen to Kanak? My God, that's the greatest <laughs> station yeah. in the freaking world. And I just wish I could listen to it. Or, you know, MMS. Or, you know, if, if you were a radio nut, you knew the rocks. You know, it's always the grass is greener on the other side. <laughs> what, was, mm-hmm. you know, what was MMS? I know Kanak, but what was MS, MMS? Uh, the buzzard? No. The buzzard. Yeah. The buzzard. Yeah, yeah the buzzard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah, there were a lot of stations like that that had great reputations, and uh, whether it was KLOS in Los Angeles or, yeah, the buzzard. You know, there's so many, and you could never hear them. Um, and now, of course, the technology is fantastic. Yeah. So uh, it is pretty cool. You can listen to anything now. Well, Michael. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to 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 plug whatever you want to plug, or yep. um, you know where people can reach out to you. You know whatever you want. How 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 do you want to be found? Well, you can find me on Facebook, of course. Who isn't on that? I just added and, you, uh, Michael. Just letting you know. What's that? I just added you as a friend. Oh, good, good. And uh, you, you can email me. My email address is. AMFMDX1980 at gmail.com. Cool. And that just specifies uh, long distance radio and the year I got into it. So crazy business, 1980. 1980. I love radio. I mean, you know, as, as, as a kid, DJs were rock stars to me. Yep. You know, there, there was nothing cooler Again, this is Minnesota related, but there was nothing cooler than going out to the Minnesota State Fair and sitting in front of the KQRS booth and actually seeing your favorite DJ on the air. Absolutely. And and, and, right. and occasionally yeah. come out of the booth and give out free records. And you were just like, This is the cool it's like meeting rock stars. DJs were the rock stars. Yeah. Well that's yeah, how I think I think it's still that way to some degree in some markets. You know, you've got some super high personalities that uh, still demand that kind of, uh, you know, attention where if you are at a remote or a state fair, yeah, you get a lot of people coming up that just want to meet you. Um, And, you know, back in the day, we were the guys behind the curtain. Nobody knew what you looked like or anything. And, of course, that's changed dramatically now. Yes. Um, You're very visible, whether you want to be or not. (laughs) Yep, yep. Yeah, but it's it's great. I still love radio. It's uh, something I've been doing for almost forty years now, and hopefully we'll be doing again soon. <laughs> Definitely. Well, after your extended vacation in the cow pies, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, th- 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 this this was fascinating. I love yes. talking radio. I love, yeah, I love this you know. Hope hopefully we gave some KISS fans an insight as to how the radio business works and radio promotion and, you know, the behind the scenes of that whole world. I, I do. I do want to, I do want to also touch on the fact that I, I was fortunate enough to be able to hang out with Eric Carr um, in New York city at a, uh, it was a radio convention. Uh, this would have been probably, oh man, early nineties, maybe 90, 91, somewhere in there. But, uh, Eric was there and uh, got to spend some time uh, talking to him. And uh, that was before he was really, you know, sick or anybody knew it. But uh, way good guy, and uh, it was just so cool to meet him. Let me, Excellent. let me, let me, let me wrap this up. You're a big enough Kiss fan, and you've been around long enough. Let me ask you the question. Oh boy! Did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? I don't think there's any doubt about it. Oh God! At look the at time. the look at the time. It's time to go. <laughs> this this was delete, awesome. We're to delete that answer. <laughs> Mark, the one guy I, Mark misses it. <laughs> I, know. I, I would. <laughs> I would say at the time uh, when you look at Creatures of the Night, for example, that we were talking about, and then uh, suddenly here comes Lick It Up, and it's a uh, it's it was a re-energized band, and I think uh, Vinny. Uh, gave them that plug for a little while. I don't think it lasted long, of course. Um, and Vinny became a problem. 
But I think for, for, for all intents and purposes in the library of Kiss, there's no doubt that Vinny gave him a shot of adrenaline on that record. Um, I'll accept, and I think he I'll, helped I'll him. accept a shot of adrenaline. That's not the okay. same as saving <laughs> Kiss. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, I don't know what they say. Yeah, I wouldn't say you can't you can't mess with the brand. The brand is the brand, um, and they they continue to do a fine job of, uh, Cause, of being. Because because frankly, if if he saved Kiss, why couldn't he save his own career? Right. Well, and that did not do well. That first Vinnie Vincent Invasion record didn't sell too well. The All Systems Go record when he got Mark Slaughter on vocals. Uh, that did significantly better, and we played quite a bit of that in Minneapolis. I remember at the time. And then, and, um, and then, and then, when the Vinnie Vincent invasion became Slaughter, it did even better. It did, and then of course <laughs> Vinnie just went away. <laughs> so <laughs> he went away. Yeah, Michael, this was this was awesome. Um, maybe I'll uh, hopefully run into you up at the conclave in a couple weeks. Um, Actually, it's next week, my friend. Next week already, Jesus! Isn't it next Tuesday? Next yeah, Wednesday? That's right. Yep. Yep. Are yeah, you up? Are well, you Are you attending there? You. Yeah, it'll be the first time I've been up there in a few years. So well, I will. Uh, I will be there for sure on Friday because I'm speaking on the podcast panel. Thanks so much for having me. Definitely a lot of fun. All right. Take care. Bye, Michael. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Lisa. Um, I love I love talking about radio. It's always been something I love, and when you can talk to somebody who's been in it, like Michael has, and seen and experienced what he has, it's just always cool. Yeah, always I agree. Cool. I've always loved radio. Um, and it's funny when you mentioned about you know the go like you mentioned Michael about going to the fair and seeing um, you know the DJs there in the booth, and yep. like that's how it was for me too. And I was so fortunate to be able to work at the greatest station in Pittsburgh. So I was very, very fortunate. And I loved every aspect of that radio station. I loved how the music was chosen, the promotions, the politics. Yeah, the, the, po the politics. The politics. The payola. There was a book written called Hitman. Oh, yeah, it's a great book. I love it. Do you know that was my, that was my required reading in college because I had took radio production, and that was one of my required books. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to read Hitman. Well, I would I would encourage everybody go out and find the book Hitman. It's fantastic. Frederick, what's what's the author's name? Frederick. Demand? No. Demand something like that. Is it? I thought it was Dan, but maybe not. Dem, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, right now. Go go um go get it, read it. It gives you a great insight into um, music industry, especially radio, radio promotion. How um, some albums became hits purely because of payola and promotion, not because they actually got airplay. And 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 now you get to look just at me, not even at Lisa. There you go, Hitman by Frederick. Dannon, I was right. Dannon, Dannon, great book. Go get it. I don't know if it's on Kindle. You can definitely find hardcover and soft cover on Amazon. Um, fascinating read about music industry, radio promotion. And, and while you were looking for that, I was like, it, it talks about how some albums became huge hits, not because they got any airplay at all, because it was all payola promotion to get them charts. That's right. As, I, as I recall, didn't it, it specifically mentions Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, I think, was one of the albums that didn't get airplay, but got a crap load of promotion that bought chart placement yep you'd be very surprised of how albums made it back in the 70s and yes. 80s and it's um it's very eye-opening and a like when i was in school we had a, a record promotion a and r guy that come in he was in charge i'm not even going to mention names or anything but he came in and spoke to my class and he said it's amazing how um, how better an album sounds when you're sitting on the beach listening to it and a new, like, back, you know, new Walkman. Right, right. You know, so it's Or just, sitting it's, on a beach that was a vacation bought for you. That's what I'm saying. Yes. So, yes. You know, how interesting it is. Well, I mean, I mean, listen, I mean. Not it, much better. It, it, it's, it's, you know. it's, nobody hides the fact that Paola was 
illegal. It was yeah. made illegal because of what it w simply was. It was radio or uh, record companies would spend money to buy ads, buy charts, buy placement. They didn't care about actual airplay. No, and they didn't care about their artists really too much either. It was all about the money that they brought in based on that artist. Right. They knew that if they got an ad and in the top 10, they would sell, they would then move X amount of units. So it's worth spending the money to buy that placement. Well, That's the right. government got involved, made that illegal. Um, it is 100% illegal now. I'm not saying it. It's completely gone away because people always try in any business to figure out how to game and work a system. But right. this book is really fascinating read about how it was happening, especially like in the 70s. Yeah, and, that's and, and, and as you read it, keep in mind the 70s is when Kiss was big as well. I think Kiss is mentioned in this book. I want to say there was a mention of yeah, Kiss as well. There is. There's a whole bunch of mentions of, of Kiss. A lot of cocaine in the book. Yeah. It's shocking. So, and so, I think Kiss was. This is my second, my second book. It's not. Um, it's not a Kiss book. But if you no, if you love the music industry, record industry, radio industry, go out and get this. It's a. It's just a great read. I'm surprised nobody's <laughs> turned it into a movie yet. No. Almost. Well, what was that movie on? What was that show on? Um, Vinyl, on, Vinyl HBO. on HBO. Almost, almost. Kind of very that. loosely based on yeah. Casablanca. But I love this book. It's great. And this, like I said, this was this is my second copy. My hard copy book was my actual school book, and there was notes and highlighted sections. I was I was actually tested on this book. Wow. Yeah. Radio tested on Google. your payola knowledge. Uh -huh. Um. So for homework this week, um. I don't know. What did you learn about the radio industry or, or promotion, rec record label promotion to radio stations? Did you learn anything new? Have you read Hitman? What do you think of Hitman? And then did you ever call your radio station requesting a song? Yeah. What was the response you got? Yep. A Kiss song. Not any. I don't care if you requested Madonna. Yeah. You called and requested Kiss. What was the response you got from the radio station? I'll tell you one of my coolest stories was when Crazy Nights came out. Um, the um, obviously, I think everybody in Pittsburgh knew I was such a, a crazy Kiss fan, so I would call up and request Kiss all the time. And as Michael said, it's not like, oh yeah, we'll play whatever you want us to. It had to fit within that playlist, and you couldn't play the same artist if you played them an hour ago. You couldn't play them for another four hours. It was like a certain rotation you had to follow. But um, when I called and asked for Crazy Nights, they weren't putting it out yet. So he played it for me over the phone. I was oh, like wow. one of the first people to listen to it. Yeah, and of course I taped it. So that was like get, that was like getting an illegal download. And I have um, I have a tape somewhere. And I have me like call on the station. They recorded me requesting another Kiss song and all that stuff. But um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Then were you ever on the radio? Did you ever request a Kiss song and your voice was on the radio asking for it? I and never. I never. I never had. I never no. had a DJ record me. Really. Oh, I did. Well, it's because you're Lisa. Well, yeah. Can I say? <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. That's your homework for this week. Facebook.com says three sides of the coin, three sides of the coin dot com, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, wherever we are. Reminder next week I won't be here. And Mark won't be here. So it's just gonna be Lisa and Tommy and God knows what you're going to do. And I will be actually in Mississippi. I will be in South Haven, Mississippi. So if there's anybody out there in the Mississippi, Memphis area, please give me a call. Because, you're, you're or gonna Facebook. Be, are you going to be playing banjo? <laughs> <laughs> now, my son has a Little League baseball game. And uh, we are there. We leave Friday morning and we're there all week in South Haven, Mississippi, which is, I think it's like 20 miles south of Memphis, maybe. So any of my Memphis Facebook friends or listeners, you know, shoot me up. Please tell me where to go because moms are all, look, we're got to sit or we're ready to rock. So, and the Minnesota meetup. Minnesota meetup, July 24th. Oh, that's right. That will be the week after. So July 24th, Joe Sensors, 7 p.m. Tommy and I are going to be out there hanging out. Um, just come on out. I didn't bring the, uh, the sticker trading cards, but we've got 
sticker trading cards that we're going to be giving away at the event. It includes Lisa on it, so get it just for Lisa. You that? can buy the trading card and cut the other three goofs off and <laughs> just have a sticker of Lisa. It's all about me. It's all about the weather girl. All right, that's it, guys. Three sides of the coin, we're out of here. I won't see you next week. Lisa will. I will. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Take Three Sides of the Coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. Download your free, free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.